one thing I found watching that movie was that before seeing the documentary, I had a vague idea about Superman Lives. I thought it sounds like an interesting project. And then watching your documentary, I'm now like gutted that we didn't get to see it. So Excellent. <laughs> presumably that was one of your intents. Uh, yeah, just it just came about that way. I mean, it wasn't my intent to like make you guys all sorrow, sorrowful and like, oh, I wish the film got made. But sort of in making it, that's how you end up feeling because you see all of this incredible creativity and everyone's team spirit and then it just gets shut down. So... Yeah, it's kind of a sorry guys. So, but <laughs> how did you first hear about it? Uh, well, I, I would like most people. Um, you know, I heard about like you know Kevin writing this, the screenplay, Tim getting hired, Nick Cage getting hired, and then it just went away. And then I saw some of the concept art in two thousand one, I believe, uh, both in some magazines and online, and it, it interested me because it had this kind of a heavy metal kind of different look to it. It didn't look like the comic books and it didn't look like the other Superman movies. It had like a different quality to it. So I remembered that years later after, you know, watching Kevin's, uh, you know, college tour, mm. I saw Superman Returns and that was like that Richard Donner uh, version of Superman, which I first thought sounded cool, but then upon seeing it fell asleep twice in the theater. Uh, Holly had to wake me up and literally I remember I was like god I was so bored I could barely remember the movie but it made me think about this version of Superman I was like at least this one had Brainiac it didn't have Lex Luthor buying land again it didn't have all this the same it had yeah. that sameness to it where I wanted something different so you know a few years later I ended up meeting Steve Johnson uh, we were at a concert and then I ended up hanging out with some friends and mentioned I had been collecting these uh, like on a folder on my desktop I had just been collecting Superman Lives concept art. Every couple months, I'd just search online to see if any new stuff had, you know, shown up. And that, that I did that for a couple of years. And some friends were like, "You should make a documentary. It sounds really interesting." And I was like, "I don't make documentaries." And someone else said, "Do it on Kickstarter," because I had raised money to do this animated kind of heavy metal cartoon on Kickstarter the year before. And you know, the idea wouldn't leave me alone. And I was like, you know, no one else is going to make this. So why should I should just try making it and do it on Kickstarter and see it, if there's other people interested in it. And if there are, then I'll make it. So it was kind of like it was a gauntlet that I threw at the, you know, the Kickstarter crowdsourcing community. And they answered by saying, here's some money. Mm. So then I was like, all right, I'm going to make it. But it took a lot longer to make because uh, I'm used to script, uh, you, you know, directing scripted stuff. The documentaries, you have no control you have to ask people to be in your thing it's not like you're hired it's like would you be in this it's different mm. so it takes a lot longer and people are like mm, i'm not so sure it took a really long time to get a bunch of people it also took a longer time to get a lot of the artists didn't want to just like get on film and start talking about stuff unless unless tim burton was talking about it which makes sense it's like hey that's the guy that hires me talk to him first then i'll talk so it was like this kind of waiting game with a lot of different of the people that you've seen in the film mm. so I mean, he was getting increasingly reticent towards the end of your interview to continue talking about it. Was it hard to get him in the first place to talk? Uh, Tim? Yeah. Um, well, that's the use of creative editing. He wasn't reticent to talk about it. But okay. um, uh, it, it did take a while to, to actually get to him. Yeah, it took over a year and a half. Um, and I ended up getting an, a letter to him by someone just outside who knew, like, sent me a, a letter. And they said, hey, I'm a fan of this project i'm working on this uh, tv show that's right across from where they're shooting big eyes here's the production manager's number and their email i don't want to get fired so i can't do anything else so i wrote the production manager of big eyes this long you know letter like hey i'm making this film blah 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 and sent it left a message mm. and then a couple weeks later i get a response from Derek fry who's uh, tim burton's executive producer and he wrote he's like tim knows about your project doesn't know if he wants to be involved but can you wait for a couple months, like maybe six months, and he'll think about it? And I was like, oh, dude, I'll wait forever. You know, it's, it's <laughs> Tim Burton, Superman Lives, yes. Yeah. So then, you know, I had to wait six months, and then the, after that six months, he was like, hey, he's going to have an opening in five months. So it was like towards the end of the, the, the following year in March, uh, can you, you know, he doesn't know, but he wants to meet you. So we, Holly and I flew out uh, and uh, ended up meeting with him, and then he, uh, he liked us, and he said, yeah, I'll do the interview. So then we did the interview two days later. Uh, Kevin Smith was the same way. Like, it took like a, a year and a half to get him. So. Mm. Although I, I've heard that anecdote of his about the no-flying, no-suit giant uh, spider thing. So he's, he's been kind of touring the globe doing that. And I think that was one of the ways that I actually found out mm -hmm. about Superman Lives. Um, both you and Kevin speak about how the internet now and kind of the prototype trolls 
in angry basements, you know, destroy the kind of movies that have a quirky edge to them. And yet, ironically, it's the internet and the interest in this film that has allowed your documentary to be made. So right. it's, I guess, a double-edged sword. It is, but I mean, it is one of those things where people still come up to me and say, man, you really dodged a bullet, can't wait to see this, and laugh at it. And then it's like, so they don't, they, a lot of people come in thinking one thing and then they leave thinking the other. So it's kind of like a, a really cool brainwashing technique that we've uh, found out how to do it, you know, with this film. Um, but yeah, you know, uh, that's kind of the, the world we live in now. It's like the golden age of comic books, you know, like eight or nine movies every year for the, in, at, for the infinite future. You're going to see like a bunch of superhero stuff. Um, but I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to allow a lot of creativity to, to get through there. I mean, you'll be a, maybe have a chance to see something like a Superman Lives, but done with a different kind of mm. character, something totally creative or different. But. Mm. Well, the fact that you animated portions of it and you got actors to um, act out parts of it, we got glimpses of what it might have been like. You obviously had to pay various permission rights to talk about the film and show props. Mm -hmm. When it came to actually animating it, how did you get the permission to do that from Warners? Because you'd well, think that sort of thing would be almost impossible. It, it is almost impossible. <laughs> um, it's a really cool thing. It's two words, fair use. It's a, I read this doctrine way before we even started the production. Yeah, please do. Yeah, no, I was going to introduce them in a second. Um, fair use is a, a thing that you basically is a transformative tool for documentarians to use to be able to use footage like you saw footage of Superman or Batman mm -hmm. when you're using it by, as an example. So you always see that in documentaries when they cut away, like as in this movie, and then you'll hear them talking about it, but you'll see clips of the film in the same way as they're talking about a scene from a script. You can then show in a demonstration as an example a very few a few seconds of the scene from the script if there's con concept art and this and that. So that was a way to get around it. Let me introduce Holly Payne. She was a producer on the film. Hello. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> yes, and I would also like to introduce our executive producer, Rob Pierce. <laughs> it's a very tiny crew that worked on this film. A uh, total of maybe, s well, the core crew was about six people. Um, it was myself, John, obviously, the director, uh, extraordinaire, and then uh, our editor, Marie Homora, who's amazing, and our technical producer, Christopher Graybill. Um, and that was, about, that was about it for, and then various, you know, cameramen, and, but this is the core team. And so it was two and a half years working on this and uh, trying to piece together a story that we didn't know we had until, we, until the, the door was open with Tim Burton, and then everything else sort of, started to fall into place. Mm. Um, but really, once we got John Peters was when I was like, <laughs> bam, oh my God. Now it's a, now it's a <laughs> movie. Oh my God. So that was, uh, that was really. And that was a month, that was actually a month before we locked picture. So before wow. we premiered this in May, the month before we interviewed John Peters and had to re break the entire film part and put it back together. Mm. But it was worth it for years after doing all these interviews, everyone kind of had a negative spin on John Peters, and so I started to develop that. I was like, I don't want to talk to him. He doesn't need to be in the movie. And Holly kept saying, no, he has to be in the movie. He's got to be in the movie. And I was like, no, but secretly still trying to get him. Well, you so, know, rights reply and all that. Yeah, eventually I talked to his attorney, <laughs> and that was the way I got to him. I got to his attorney, hey, your client, I'd like him in my film. And then I talked to him for like 45 minutes, had his attorney laughing, and then a week later he said no. And then a week after that, he said yes. And then we went there and filmed the interview. It was two hours, and it was fantastic. John Peters is awesome. He is awesome. And actually, even, uh, let's see, it was about two weeks after a premiere in L.A., and John Peters had heard through the grapevine, people, friends of his, had seen the film at the premiere and, and those subsequent dates, and had said to him, you, you're kind of the hero of this, you're kind of the star of this movie, you know, and your hair looks great. <laughs> um, <laughs> And <laughs> it looks, good, it looks yeah. amazing. Um, and so he called John uh, two weeks after the premiere and, and wanted to congratulate him in person. And uh, so he hasn't seen the film yet. He's going to see the film. When we get back to L.A., he'll be seeing the film um, for the first time. We're going to screen it privately in his penthouse apartment on Wilshire Boulevard. Um, years. Yeah, he has actually, he has like an elevator that goes directly to his apartment. It's like this, this it is very much like bat, Batman. You know, it's like you just... Get on, and then there's John Peters. And there's a skull ship right there. Oh, yeah, no, that was really cool. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty well, that, that was an amazing anecdote to know that he stole the prop because he knew that <laughs> everything was well, going to go to I the record. I don't know if he stole well, it. Well, you know what I mean. Yeah. He rescued it. He rescued it, yeah. 
<laughs> placed it inside of a weird glass cube. That was the yeah. first thing he said to us after this. When we when we walked into the his beautiful apartment, which. I mean, you know, first thing you see is, well, first thing you see when you go in there is what you saw in the very beginning, which is that uh, Richard Branagh sort of weird mannequin in the, the wheelchair oh, with yeah. the, you know, from yeah. Wild Wild West. But then you look around and you see, holy shit, there's a Modig Modigliani, there's a Matisse. You know, it's like this it is, he's such an old school Hollywood mega producer. Um, but yeah, it was, he, one of the first things he showed us, though, when we walked in was, He's like, there's the skull ship, if you want to see it. Like, there it is. Knuckles. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> Loudly. Yeah. 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 Mallets. Yeah. Um, Meat claws. <laughs> you said it was a really small crew, but obviously it's really long credits, and that's because there's hundreds and hundreds of... Thousands. Thousands yes, right. of Kickstarter, and what was the, the fan uh, one? Fan-backed. Fan-backed. I've yeah. not heard of that one. Well, yeah, so primary, primarily it was Kickstarter. Fan back to smaller crowdsourcing thing. But uh, it, w it worked out. We, we went broke four times making this film, wow. which is awesome. I, I, I highly recommend getting broke well, multiple I, times. It's really kick-ass. I, I had to look at your fan-backed... <laughs> I had to look at your fan-backed uh, page earlier, and it's interesting that you were really honest with the people who were backing it, saying this is how much the following will cost. Mm -hmm. You know, rights, this kind of production, this kind of footage. So I guess every time you needed more money, you told the fans, this is exactly what we need, and yeah. they well, helped you out. Well, that's the thing about Kickstarter or any kind of crowdfunding uh, campaign, is it, it's a community. You know, these are the people that are making your film, these are the people who are contributing, so you have to keep them in the loop with everything you're doing. Mm. And that way they feel like they're an actual part of the, the process, which they are, because we mm. couldn't make it without them. So. Um, so yeah, updates went out, you know, weekly and monthly about what was happening throughout the course mm. of the making of the film. Yeah, and I, I hit all the the drug fueled binges that I went on in like padded areas. I was like, this four thousand dollar expense <laughs> for my cocaine habit is so, yeah, it's like, <laughs> you know what I mean? No, it's like really you break it all down, and then it's always the truth. It's always three times more. Yeah. It doesn't. It's three times longer than you think it's going to take. It's three times more money than you think it's gonna I've I've budgeted thousands of things I know three times more it doesn't even matter anymore now I just triple it automatically whatever budget I've come to I triple it and then I don't budge from that I know it's still impossible because then you're like well we have this money you don't weird things just happen you need to buy additional drives like even just drives if you haven't budgeted drives you have a four terabyte or a 12 terabyte or a 16 terabyte drive that's a couple extra thousand dollars but if you need to get six of them Guess what? You know, so yeah, yeah, it adds yeah. up. We were we were completely flat broke when we came here to interview Tim, and we actually didn't know that we were going to get the interview. We were we came out here with the hope that we were going to get Tim, um, but we had to be vetted first. So we went on a Wednesday. We talked with him for probably about fifteen minutes. That was it. Um, and we bonded on. Uh, I bonded on on uh, children's illustration with him, and John bonded on horror films. Mm -hmm. And within about fifteen or ten minutes, he said, "Okay, I'll do this thing." And it was it was great because he was you know he clearly got that we were coming from a good place, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and that and then we shot it two days later, and that was it. One thing I wanted to ask about was this is almost like a new genre of documentary that's emerged over the last few years. I guess the first example would have been Terry Gilliam's Lost in La Mancha right. about. Uh, the man who killed Don Quixote not being made. And then there's also been the Jodorowsky June recently. Yeah. I mean, what do you think is this fascination about people wanting to know about films that just didn't quite get made? Well, it's also, I mean, there's several, I mean, on the internet, there's always like every year there's a, a roundup of films that didn't get made. There's also Terry Gilliam's Watchmen. There's a whole bunch of like Darren Aronofsky's Batman year one. There's a whole bunch of these films that like, you know, and then get shuttered. Uh, the fascination, I think, at least for me with Superman Lives was the what if and the, boy, you know, I just, you know, after seeing a bunch of different iterations, I wish they made that one because I would like the chance to be able to to watch it, in not just in my mind, but to have seen it because I thought it sounded cool. Yeah. So I think that's what happens. I mean, there's several books written on the what-ifs of a bunch of different films that didn't get made. I mean, there's somebody who's going to make the George uh, Miller Justice League. Yeah. They, somebody just announced that. And uh, that's a person who followed me on my a – I do an AMC movie talk show in America. And he was a fan of that and then sort of just was like, I think, got influenced and inspired by it. So I was like – I just wrote him. I was like, hey, man, just make sure you uh, you know mention my goddamn fucking film every time. <laughs> you Because like, you're using the same credits and everything, the way, kind of copying me. But it's – hey, just make it make it good. That's all I said. It was a good, good luck. you know, Because I myself, I'm like – He doesn't have John Peters, though. I just uh, a lot of people keep asking me, well, what, what's your next documentary? Like it's it's always the what you just finished. And I was like, dude, did you notice that I directed cartoon shows for fifteen years? Well, what's your next documentary? It's really it's a weird thing to get square pegged so quickly. So I'm not doing another documentary. Well, 
if you come from cartoons, I was just going to say, do you think Warner would now ever approach you to say, actually, could you make the Superman Lives animated film? <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't do it. I mean, <laughs> okay. I mean, I hope they do. Someone, I hope someone does it. But to me, that movie is done. It didn't get made. It stopped being made in 1998. And that's where it ends. It sort of ends there. There was no finished script. And if you're a filmmaker, you know it's like the script is a process. It's not the be-all, end-all, unless you're the writer, director, producer, editor, and you're in it. And you follow it all the way through. And still, it's going to transform. Mm. But when you have a script, it goes through all these different changes, all the way through the editing and sound design, everything. The actors, they all add and take away, put mm. back in. Everything gets changed, and it's very malleable. So you could see all the different versions of like Kevin Smith's script, you know, Wesley Strick's script, uh, Dan Gilroy's script. The story beats are all the same, but they're completely different dialogue. It's completely different scenes. It's totally different. So you don't know what that final film would have been. So if you don't have Tim Burton involved in it, it's just not going to be Superman Lives. I wanted to uh, go back to the you know the various sort of what if happened. Uh, what if movies that have been coming down the pike? Each one of these films was in a different stage of development hell. So, for example, Jodorowsky's Dune, it, you had a, a Bible of concept art. You know, you, nothing was shot, nothing was in pre production at that point. Uh, you know, with, with Superman Lives, there was a lot done, you know, and with Lost in La Mancha, they were shooting. So, each one of these films is sort of a different example of this is how far you can get. And have the rug pulled out from under you. So each story is completely different. You know, I, at this point, I don't know how far they got with George Miller's, you know, Justice yeah. League, but um, but that's going to be a different story too. So it's you know, I think it's about the creative process, and people are so fascinated with with how movies are made. You know, we see these blockbusters, but we don't really know what goes into making them. One of the things that John and I were so excited about with this was when we went to Tim Burton's studio and we got to look at. You know, we were there for two 16-hour days. Mm going through every single page of concept art and blown away by every sin single image we, we saw. And it was just, it's like you can see, like your heart starts to hurt. You're like, oh my God. But what was great was that we got to interview all the concept artists that actually made this stuff and they are never seen. No one ever talks to these people. Yeah. So once they saw the film at our premiere, they were like, I'm so proud to be a part of this. This is yeah. so cool. They, and they hadn't seen their own work for over 16 years. It just got shelved away. And what she's talking about is Tim Burton gave us the keys to his like Raiders of the Lost Ark shop in Los Angeles. Now, not here in England. He was like, there you go. It's like, find it. And it was like, you know, walking through Edward Scissorhands and Mars Attacks. But then we got to these couple boxes of Superman Live stuff. And that's what we spent two days photographing. All This isn't even all of the art. This, like, this is like maybe 70% of it. But, I mean, you know. It's pretty, it was pretty fun, and it blew me away because I thought I was like, yeah, I got most of the art. I thought that's what I, I've been searching the internet for about two years. It can't, there might be a little bit left. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, just a Krypton, you know, just so much. Look at these weird universes. Here's Doomsday, you know. Um, well, we were in, uh, we were talking to Nick Cage's manager for about. Um, almost, well, a year and a half. Um, and it was sort of a cat and mouse game for a while. Um, initially, you know, he'd already been asked because this, the Kickstarter was announced. And then in various junkets, the Crudes, for example, he was asked about it and what he thought about uh, the film, the documentary potentially being made. And he said, you know, I think it's a good idea. You, you heard him say that in the film. But in the very, in that, at that time, you know, he, the internet sort of bullying of Nicolas Cage had uh, wasn't at full full volume at that point. So um, as that continued, he became more and more sort of reticent to participate. Um, and so we, you know, I kept in contact with Mike, and I sh we showed him a rough cut, a very early rough cut, and he said, "I think Nick would really like this." But you know, at the same time, Nick is also wor a working actor who's working all the time. So there was a there was a point around the time we were going to film. John Peters, and there was a window of about a week where we could have gotten Nicolas Cage, and that was the time we were maybe going to meet with him. It was still kind of like he'd, he'd warmed to the idea, but ultimately he decided rather than coming back to Vegas to his home, he would go from one film directly to the other. So he went from Morocco, I think, to New York and didn't come back, and that was the end of our window. And Ultimately, I don't think that the, the film loses anything for not having an interview with him now because you have him in the suit. You have him talking about the character. You have him working it out with Tim Burton, you know, both as Clark Kent and Superman. And it's like it's, it's of a time and place. 
And that's where you really want to get the information anyway. So um, there is a chance. I'm not going to say. I'm not going to say what's going to happen, but there's DVD a chance. DVD commentary. Well, <laughs> well, I'll tell you this much. Okay, so uh, about two weeks ago, we got a call from Mike again, and he said he was so happy with, uh, pleased with all the reviews, and he said Nick really wants to see the film. So hopefully, we will be able to show it to him within the next few weeks, um, and then we'll see where it goes. You know, I don't know if he's actually going to be able to sit down and talk with us, and you know, I mean, that would be amazing. Yeah, but we'll yeah. We're never leaving Las Vegas. We're just going to move in with him. We're going to hang out. And uh, uh, we're not, I mean, we, we already decided, even if, even if say, we do talk to him, it would be an additional thing on the Blu-ray because the film is done. And it really feels like when we got that footage of Tim and Nick from 15 years ago talking and, like, it's a fly-on-the-wall type of perspective that you get to see the developmental process. So that, to me, is better than any of the actual possible interviews you could have with any of the actors that were, like, Kevin Spacey or even Christopher Walken, who's, you know, I want to see that Kevin Spacey and Christopher Walken with two heads yeah, arguing. Absolutely. I mean, that's, yeah. like, that's the thing that hurts. I'm like, God, I would love to see that, you know? 15 years ago. Can't do it now, but if back then. So without a doubt, uh you we cut to the ILM footage of Brainiac in that sort of viper thing that you get to see there. That for me is just like a holy sh how could we, I mean, I'm so pissed off that I didn't get to see that on the big screen. Uh, for me, that absolutely nails it. I was perfect answer for me. Uh, it's tough. It's really tough. But I would say that the stuff that had the most impact for me was Brainiac by by um, Michael Anthony Jackson. With all the kind of like you know sort of uh, computery. He looks very. It's, it's not just the spider body, but it's that kind of intense, scary kind of Grim Reaper stuff that I really liked. Yeah, for myself, it was Krypton. It was all the outer space stuff. I really liked that interpretation, that weird kind of almost Dr. Seussy look. It was so radically different than everything that we've ever seen. Like, it's icy and cold, and here's some stalagmites and a, bu a bunch of weird shards and a weird crystal. It's like, get rid of all that stuff. I'm tired of it. You know what I mean? It's like, that's, I mean, a lot of people didn't like Man of Steel. I liked it. And I liked it specifically because it did different things. Mm -hmm. That, to me, is why I enjoyed it. You know, you can argue about, you know, the, you know, the pa, like, don't save me from the hurricane. You know, there's a lot of issues. <laughs> I'm not going to fight that stuff. It's stupid. But most of it's pretty awesome. I thought it was a really cool reinvigoration of the character, and it brought that character into a now area, which I think, you know, now he's got to learn his lesson, and Batman's going to kick his ass. So that's kind of what, you know, they're like, he did 48 9-11s. He just let all those people die. It's like he was just Superman for one day, guys. I don't, I mean, honestly, early on, they basically, you know, Warner and DC were like, we know what we're doing. We, we're aware of it. We're not going to help you in any way, shape, or form, but good luck with this. So, you know, I mean, I think that, it'll, it, you know, it remains to be seen. This film still hasn't been seen by, by very many people. You know, it's a very limited audience that's seen this. Oh, sorry. I had a second. You know, one of the things, a follow-up to what you just said, I think that, uh, you know, after seeing this, once we put this together and saw it as a piece of, of work here as a film, uh, Warner's, in my opinion, at that particular time, if they would have followed through with this picture, it really would have been more a savior situation for them in their financial dilemma at that time, instead of a uh, uh, you know cold feet and back away from it. So, uh, you know, that's kind of they didn't learn from that mistake. It's unfortunate, but uh, let me triple add to that. <laughs> and here's a triple Sunday scoop for you. Um, Above and beyond, like Warner Brothers not making the film, I think you know when you don't make something, they try to bury it, and that's usually. That's usually what happens with every single film that you'll, you know, what happened to this film. They bury it, they shove it away, all these people sign rights things where they can't talk about it. So it takes someone else to be like, I, I don't, I didn't sign anything. <laughs> you know, you can come in. Um, but you have to have a form of respect with the material. And it's a, like the way I approach it, I've worked for Warner Brothers for like 16 years on all these different projects. And so my approach to it wasn't, I wasn't like, I'm going to take Warner Bros. down for doing this thing. I'm going to embarrass them and this and that. I was, had never had any of that intention. It was more like, I'm just going to find out and no one's going to stop me. So it's like, that's the, my kind of approach about it. Like when people would say they don't want to be interviewed, I would be really respectful if they said no right away. But if they were like hemming and hawing, I'd call them back. I'd re-email them two or three months later. Like Sylvain, who is an awesome interview. He's an ex-concept artist, very has and tasty bitter edge to him but I wanted that in the film I desperately yeah. I was like dude I was like you're gonna say stuff that a lot of other artists are not gonna say it's so important he emailed me uh, after we had our premiere in LA and he said so do I need to go into witness protection now <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, so to say that for Warner Brothers, yeah, they said they weren't going to help, but they were also aware of the film. And I think they're actually going to be really pleased with this film when they finally see it, the top brass Warner Brothers or whatever, because it's not actually any kind of indictment. It's it's basically, hey, dude, it's the truth. Like, you had a series of bombs. You couldn't make that $300 million commitment. No one's going to be angry with you. You know, it's like... That's how I look at it. So, and also they'll probably sell more copies of the other Superman DVDs on the back of this. I, I agree. <laughs> I think it's only going to benefit them ultimately. Yeah. You know, it gets their name out there again. You know, and yes, this was a string of bombs that happened in the '90s, but it's it's got their name out there. Yeah. So, it made me want to see Sphere. <laughs> Initially, I mean, I'll, I'll speak first but, and hand it off to John, but I think the, f the first thing is that I think that, you know, there, there is this, this curtain, this veil over Hollywood where you think you know what goes on, but you don't really know what goes on. You don't know how much work and how many man hours go into making something like this. And this, you know, especially with this film, it was such a unique situation with all of the various people that were involved and the artists and all this stuff that it's, um, it, it shows you how, how things get get started uh, and and how major corporations like Warner Brothers DC get sort of nervous. Well, for myself, yeah, to me, I felt like as I was going through the process of making the documentary and interviewing the artists and uncovering a lot of the artwork, I found it to be something that happens in in every form of all media. There's always these films, television shows, pilots get made and then no one gets to see them. So I myself have made three pilots that you'll never see. I've spent a year and a half working on different things that no one gets to see. So Until someone makes a documentary about it. I know. Ten years <laughs> <laughs> what, what happened to my weird secret vault? But yeah. Uh, yeah, so seriously, it's like I totally empathize, empathized with Tim and like the two and a half years of his life that he spent and then just, you know, to have that thing severed, it's, it's messed up. But... Uh, for me, like the concept art and seeing that kind of stuff and knowing that exists on all these other levels could be inspirational for other companies to be like, look, there's a secondary market. Obviously, there's people interested in the not the final product, but the products that lead to the final product. So to bury all that stuff and just be embarrassed about it, you shouldn't be. You should be like, look, we tried this. We decided it didn't work for these different reasons. Here, here, put it on YouTube. Here, we could release it on Hulu Plus. Like Hulu has like, we've got the uh, the archived weird whatevers, you know? I don't know. I mean, there's. A, I just feel like at least making this documentary for me, it was. Uh, it felt really good. You know, it was a lot of work. We were like, you know, the every day for like the last eight months working on it. It was a lot to edit. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to mention, too, is that after we premiered it in L.A., um, we had a handful of people that worked on the film. We had Wesley Strick. Uh, we had, a, you know, a lot of the concept Timber artists. Guard, Tim Burgard, Bill Bowes, Bill Bowes Michael, Michael Anthony Jackson, Rick Heinrichs. They all came to see the, the, the film. And at the end of the film, they all came up to us and said, thank you. Thank you so much. This is more than I, we ever expected from this documentary and there's so much about this film that we didn't even know about and thank you for giving us the time to actually to, to show what we do 